So uh, finally, I'm going to introduce uh, May Laura. She doesn't need much of an introduction, but uh, I decided I met her last cycle in 2022. Uh, very impressed with the young lady. Um, she says the right things. She is from her heart, genuine, authentic, real. Um, great story, amazing person. She's a great candidate. And I'll just mention one thing here: is if if you have time, this is pretty technical. But what it basically says is that she outperformed our Republican candidates by 20 percent. Above expectations. So, if somebody says you can't win, think about history, think about biblical history, think about secular history. All those times in the world, in our history, across, around this planet, where people that were running against the odds won. So this talks about it and how she did, and how she can do this time in a regular presidential term when she runs. So, I give her a, thousand, a ton of credit for doing this, great candidate, great person. She'll say a few words, and then she'll introduce uh, our speaker, all right? So, say hello to Mayor Lar John. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my meet and greet tonight. I appreciate your time and your energy being here. Um, without your support, I would be standing here also. So. Give yourself an applause. Applause yourself for coming here, being part of this process. I know many of you know who I am, but I'm gonna briefly just uh, give you a little information, a little bit background of who I am in case some of you don't know who I am. Um, I'm running for Congress in the fourth district here. I am a mother of four. Uh, two of my sons uh, served in uh, the U.S. military. I am. Um, I was a teacher in St. Paul Public Schools for 20 years, and now I am currently in real estate and also um, in business. Um, and before I get going, I want to apologize for my raspy voice. I've been battling this cold for the last few weeks, and and so um, it's been kind of hard to talk. And I'm trying to save my. Um, voice for Saturday too for the uh, endorsement convention um, on Saturday. So I'm going to ask you. A, I'm going to start out with a question. Have you realized today that we work harder, we pay more taxes, but we live worse than before? Do you know why that is? <laughs> Democrats spending too much money. Well, that's because the failed leadership in this country, yeah. in D.C., that's taking our hard-earned tax dollars overseas to protect other countries' borders, but they fail to secure ours. They fail to protect you. They fail to protect your children, and they fail to protect this country. They want us to work harder, take our taxes, take our money. But they're not doing anything for us. That's why we see a lot of our veterans out on the street, even our children. And that's why we see the chaos and the borders down south. And even in, up in uh, the north too. We, we border Canada and a lot of times we don't know what's happening in the border, but drugs, criminals are coming from both borders. And our government is not doing anything about it. So we need to change that. We need to change new leaders. We need a new leader who will represent us, who will work for us, and who will make sure that they protect our lives. So when I'm elected, I want to make sure that your rights will not be taken away. That your children's education will be a priority. Parents will have the choice 
as to take where to take uh, their children to. That's important because right now they're indoctrinating our children. They're taking their education away. You know why they're doing that? Because they want to control your children. They want to indoctrinate them. We don't need that. We need leadership. And these children are going to be leaders in this country. We need to make sure that we provide academic excellence for them. That is a priority. We want safe neighborhoods. We don't want to defund the police. Let's double the police force so every neighborhood won't be safe again. We need protection. The other thing we're going to do is we have in Minnesota right here, our seniors are paying social security taxes with my influence. I'm going to work with the leaders in Minnesota to get rid of that. Why do they need to pay any more taxes than they have? We need to get rid of social security taxes in Minnesota. I know that this is a, a state and local, but I want to use that influence to help our leaders to get rid of that. I truly believe that. But the most important thing is that when I'm elected, Minnesotans, Americans, will be first and foremost you are not going to come last. Your safety, your freedom, and your children will come before anything because this is your country. I am a legal immigrant who came here, who was able to live the American dream, had the privilege to go to school, raise my family, uh, have a house and jobs. And I know that this is not the, this is not a perfect country or it's not the best country in the world, but it is the, I'm so sorry. It is not a perfect country, but it is the best country in the world. Like I said, my rusty voice and feel sick. It's, uh, it's kind of tough. So that's the least that this country can do for you, is that you come first, America come first. So with that being said, I have a special guest speaker tonight. And she is going to talk about North Korea and South Korea. Uh, she is a Korean. And Jenny Choi, I will let her introduce um, herself and also her background. So Jenny. <laughs> and to be asked to speak in front of you today. I think you may want me to speak today because she and I share the same conviction that, as she said, the United States of America may not be the perfect country, but it is the very best country for the any opportunities and freedom it stands for. America offers the same opportunities to anyone and everyone who wishes to come here and work hard to achieve their American dream. I myself was born and raised in South Korea. I came to the United States as an international student with legal student visa, and now I am legal permanent resident of the United States with the American dream. That's right. Now like those intruders, invaders or infiltrators that are coming from the south border as we speak today. And I honestly despise anybody who's calling them illegal immigrants. They are not immigrants. They are just intruders and invaders. They are not the same as me and May up here. Despite I'm a foreigner, 
English is a second language of mine. I'm a woman, I'm a minority. Democrat will make you believe that I couldn't achieve anything in the United States with all of these racism. That's not true. I was able to get into prestigious colleges and I was able to get into prestigious companies with nothing but my own hard work. I graduated Smith Colleges, college with economics degree, and I worked at Morgan Stanley Investment Banking, I worked at General Electric, I worked at UBS Investment Banking, I worked for Bridgewater Associates, which is the largest hedge fund to this date. I worked at TPG, a private equity fund, which is one of the largest private equity fund out there. And now I'm a chief operating officer of finance uh, advisory firm in the United States. I'm also a co-founder of an asset management business in South Korea. If I can do that, anyone can do that. And that is what America offers, and that is what American dream is all about. And that's why I'm going to speak up and as much as I can so the next generation, next person, anybody like me, anybody who wishes to work hard, legally coming to the United States, can achieve that dream and have the same opportunities and privileges that were offered to me. In my 25 years of working in the United States, I never had an experience, I didn't get the position because of my race or because of my gender. At the same time, no opportunity was given to me just because of my race or my gender. And that's how we achieve it, based on merit. And that's the American dream. And no other country offers that. So up until about last year, I was sitting in your spot not up here. I didn't get involved. I thought, why get involved? I'm just not going to speak up. After all, United States, I am not a U.S. citizen. I'm still a South Korean citizen. Despite the fact that I pay taxes here, not South Korea, I left here longer than South Korea. Just like all of you are here because America means something to you, because it's your country. Same for me. South Korea means something to me. That's why I'm still a South Korean citizen, but I have a permanent resident card. In perfect word, I would love to be dual citizen, but South Korean does not approve that. So that's why I am still a South Korean citizen, but I live here and pay taxes here. The reason I start speaking up is because I start seeing things that are so wrong and so unjust so many times. First, it was discriminating against Asian students when getting into colleges. We kind of all knew they were discriminating against Asian students, but we didn't have a proof. But because of the lawsuit, colleges did not have a choice but to admit that they are discriminating against Asian students when admitting to the college. What? In America. They are openly discriminating against a certain group of people because of their race. Yet, nothing happened. No corrections. No public apologies. They continue to discriminate. Then, it was against white men. At first, it was a subtle rejections by HR department in hiring for corporations. Now, a lot of big corporations, a lot of big banks, and some of the banks that I work, used to work at, now they have a target quota of how many of the white men they are going to replace with other minorities. They're officially, openly discriminating against a certain group of people in America. Yet, nothing happens. No public apologies, no corrections. They're continuing to discriminate. Then, it was against women. First, they were violating women's protected areas, such as the locker rooms and bathrooms. Then, now, it's discriminating against young female athletes in women's sports, for God's sake. And the President of the United States, instead of correcting this issue and making them apologize and lose all their jobs, he's on their side, discriminating against female athletes. And now, all the colleges, our campuses, are filled with chanting of anti-Semitic remarks. 
They are calling for genocide of the Jews, it's Israelis. Didn't we just try, somebody try to do that about 70 years ago? And we all agree that was a horrendous thing. And now they are calling for rivers to the seas. Not only that, now they are calling for a death to America. And more and more I hear people saying, we need to make America to become a socialistic country. And that's when I said, no more. No. No. I say enough is enough. Right. It is now time that all of us, you, me, everyone here, we need to stand up and fight for what's right and just. And how do we do that? I think we start doing that by, by voting the right candidates and send them to the United States Congress. And I think May is the perfect one you should vote for to send them to the United States Congress in November. So now let's talk about socialism, <laughs> right? When I first heard people talking about socialism, I thought, oh, come on. They're going to go home, they're going to Google it to see what socialism is really about, and they will just drop it and feel embarrassed they talked about it. Man, was I wrong. Despite my contrary to my thoughts, the socialistic movements grew stronger, stronger, and bigger. And here we are. As all of you know, socialism has been tried and failed spectacularly so many times. Soviet Union, China, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, Laos, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Albania, Angola, Belarus, Congo, go on and go on and on. And even all of these countries gave up the pursuit of socialism and moved over to capitalism. And in 2024, the United States wants to try socialism again. If that's not the definition of insanity, I don't know what that is. If those are countries that listed what's good enough for you, we have a perfect twin study. As some of you may know, in medical field, twin study is guarded as the highest quality study because you can hold all of the other variables constant except just one variable and observe what happens to this twin over the long period of time. That's South Korea and North Korea. That's my country. Korea has over five thousands of years of history together. We always have been one country, one people. We have our own language, we have same history, same culture, same everything. If I send my sample to one of those DNA companies, they will tell me I'm 100% Korean. That's how, how homogeneous country we are. After all 5,000 years, one day, July 27th, 1953, a very homogeneous Korean, company, Korean country was divided into two. South Korea went with the United States and Western European country and we chose capitalistic country. North decided to go with the Soviet Union and China and chose socialistic country. That's it. That is the only difference between North and South Korea, ideology. You know, socialism always has been and still is marketed this utopia, right? Everybody will share things equally. Nobody poor, nobody rich. Everybody will be taken care of. Everybody will get free housing, free education, free health care. You will have jobs and we'll all share together. Sounds frigging nice, doesn't it? That sounds like the DFL. <laughs> the catch and always the biggest problem is the very first step of socialism. In order to start this utopia, government has to take all of your property assets, belongings, wealth, houses, and everything you own. And a lot of young people, especially young people nowadays, think, oh, I don't have anything to give, nothing to lose. Great, I'm gonna get some, and you're gonna lose. They couldn't be any more wrong, could they? 
likely all of those young people walk up with a roof over their head, clothes on their back, and likely they have a lot of different electronics, clothes, and so forth. And most importantly, they have some knowledges and skills. And that does not belong to you either. Even your mind does not belong to you. You think you have nothing? You only have a body? Guess what? They're going to put you to physical labor. And now, welcome to socialistic country, college kids. And that's what socialism is about. And who is ever going to give up all of their assets, all of their belongings so freely to the government? No one. That's where the violence starts. Governments now are going to forcefully take all of your belongings and assets from you. And everybody will fight back. So what do they do? They need to put fear in people. That's where the public killing comes in. There is nothing better than shooting people and hanging people in public and make you watch it. And that will make you give up fighting. That's the still the first step of the socialism. And because of the need for the violence, and because of the need of the controlling everyone in that country, inevitably going to be a last person standing who is willing to do the most cruel thing, willing to kill the most, willing to do the most violent things of, on their own people will hold all that power. That's why in history will tell you every socialistic tribe inevitably had a dictator. Some of you know, some of these dictators you know very well. Adolf Hitler killed 17 million people. Joseph Stalin killed 23 million people. Mao Zedong of China is estimated to kill 49 to 78 million people. Benito Mussolini, half a million people. Pol Pot, two million people. Kim Il Sung of North Korea is estimated to kill 1.6 million. His son, Kim Jong Il, and his grandson, Kim Jong Un, are still killing people in North Korea as we speak. See, the biggest problem of socialism is this violence. Socialism is estimated to kill about 100 million people. Some historians say actually it's close to 200 million people. Let's put that into perspective. World War I killed about 40 million people, and that is the highest estimation. World War II had about 85 million. Socialism killed 100 to 200 million people. And some of you might say, well, they're not all socialistic countries. There's some kind of communism. They're Nazism, fascism, totalitarianism, Marxism, Leninism. Let me tell you something. This is all different shades of one thing, socialism. For example, a lot of people love to correct me. Well, North Korea is not a socialistic country, Jenny. They are a totalitarian country. Let me read it to you what totalitarian is. Totalitarian is a form of government and political system that prohibits all opposition parties, outlaws, individual, and group opposition to the state, and its claims to exercise extremely high, if not complete, degree of control and regulation over public and private life. Do you really think North Korea started there? As a totalitarian country, they said, oh, yeah, sign me up, I'm going there. No. They all chose socialism. It was right after the Korean War, which was very cruel for our country. And before the war, we were colonized by Japan for many years. So it was a really tough many years we went through. So a lot of people chose socialism. They really thought they were doing something noble and just. And it will be all be shared equally and they will leave this utopia. That's what they thought. It's a perfect bait and switch of dangling socialism and going to different directions. And that's one of the reasons no country ever lived in socialistic country despite so many tribes. Nobody actually gets there. 
And sadly, and everybody thinks that North Korean people are stuck in that country, and they are. I could have bo been born just one hour north of where I, I was born. I was born in Seoul, Korea. An hour is driving from Seoul is where the DMZ of the North Korea is. If I was born just one hour above, out of it a North Korean, nothing different from me. So let's talk about this so North Korea and South Korea, perfect twin study. Let's see how their countries differ in 70 years after 5,000 years of same thing. First, GDP. I believe everybody knows what GDP is, right? GDP per capita from 1950 to 2010. This is according to World Bank and BBC. As you can see, up to about 1974, we're tomato, tomato about similar, and then we diverged and we never looked back. So I'm sure all of you guys can imagine North Korea, South Korea, we have a lot more GDP than they are. Guess how many times? 500 times? How about we are about now, as of 2022, GDP per capita of South Korea is about 385,000, and North Korea is about $800. 43 times. While South Korea grew our economy by 70 times, North Korea basically stayed flat in 70 years. South Korea is the 13th largest economy at this time, and North Korea is about 10%. What about exports? I'm sure you guys can imagine that South Korea exports far more than North. Right? Obviously. 100 times? 200 times? 500 times? How about 2,243 times more? South Korea exports about 684 billion, and North Korea exports about 304 million. Only difference, ideology. Socialism is what gets you. What do you think the biggest exports of South Korea is? Samsung, yeah, phones, cars, a lot of electronics. It's actually circuit boards, chips. We export about 63 billion of circuit boards, chips, to the United States and every other countries. What do you think of North Korea exports? Ammunition. Ammunition is good. But yes, it's coal. They are still exporting coal. And of course, they are selling some of their military equipment and so forth to Russia and Iran. I'm sure they are, but it's against US, UN sanction. Electricity. I thought about a lot of different statistics to show you today. A picture is a thousand words, right? This picture was taken from space by NASA. As you can see, South Korea lights up like a Christmas tree. Whereas North Korea, they actually had to put a line where North Korea is because it's so dark. There is no electricity. Pyongyang is their capital. That's where Kim Jong-un lives. That's why you see a little bit of a light there. North Korea electricity generation is less than 5% of South Korea. Life expectancy. Obviously, it is hard to get data out of North Korea because they don't really announce or share any of their data, as you can imagine. So I brought three different statistics. This one is according to World Bank and BBC. As you can see, our life expectancy between South Korea and North Korea is about 13 years. And remember, we've been separated only 70 years. And we live about 13 years longer than they are. Do you see the big dip of the North Korea? That was major famine that they went through in North Korea, that's why. And this is according to South Korea's Department of Statistics, about 12 years. North Koreans live 12 years shorter than South Koreans. National Institute of Health estimates North Korea by men about shorter by 8.1 years 
and four women, 11.2 years. Again, only one difference, ideology, socialism. Physical difference in people. This one is with uh, teenagers, a 17 year old. So this side of the graph is a South Korean, 1965 all the way to 2010. 17 year old boys, about, boys are about 5'7", and girls are about 5'2". North Koreans, we me me measure all the defectors out of North Korea. We measure them anyone from 19 to 29. So they are full adult size, not teenagers. Still, men are about 5'4", and women are 5'4'9". They're much, much shorter than South Koreans. Again, 70 years, less than three generations. This one is the most painful statistic here. It's about children under the age of five years old. North Korean babies, about 15% are underweight in North Korea. Close to 30%, they're not developing properly because of malnutrition. It's one in three children, one in three child, are malnutrition in North Korea. Whereas South Korea, we have opposite issue. 6.7% of South Korean kids have an overweight issue. They do not have that issue. Also, according to National Institute of Health, North Koreans are shorter by four to five inches than South Koreans, and they weigh about 15 to 20 pounds less than average South Koreans. That's a lot of difference between just the same people, same DNA of the people. And remember I told you, I showed you the famine? North Korea official stance is that they had about 225 to three, 235,000 people killed in famine. We say that's a bullshit. We say it's as high as 3.5 million people who were dead. And prior to that famine, their population was only 22 million. That is more than 10%, close to 20%. One in 10, one in five of their whole population just died because of famine. Roads. Let's talk about the length of the roads. So North Korea, geographically, they are about 1.2 times bigger than South Korea. So they are bigger than we are. In South Korea, we have about close to about 100,000 kilometers, which is about 61,000 miles. Out of that, 92% is paved. And 8% of the roads are unpaved. Can you guess how much, what percent of the road that they have compared to South Korea? Same hundred? 90%? 80%? How about about 25%? No <laughs> That's right. And because, guess what? 97% are unpaved. Only 3% is a paved road in North Korea. Let's talk about cars. How many cars do we have versus North Korea? We need some baseline. How about United States? Per thousand people, United States have about 900 cars. You guys have a lot of cars here. <laughs> that includes all the children that's sitting over here. You have a 900 people have a car per thousand population. What about South Korea? We have about 526, about half the population have a car, including children. No wonder we have so many traffic issues. Do you want to guess how much North Korea has per 1,000? 50? How about one? <laughs> South Korea has about 25 million cars. North Korea has about 30,000 cars. Mobile phones. Yeah, we make a lot of mobile phones. Some of you guys have probably from you have Samsung phones, LG phones, and all of those phones. We have a lot of phones. We have about 58.9 million phones, and our population is about 50 million. 
So we have more than one per person, including children. So we have a different issue. How about North Korea? How many people, how many millions of the North Koreans do you think have? 3.2 million. However, you kind of, kind of shocking too. You're like, wow, they have a phone? Then why don't they just Google it? They'll find out all the information. Because their phone does not connect to the internet. It only connects to the intranet that is governed by North Korea. So they can't go to Google, they can't go to YouTube, no Facebook, no, none of those. Ask your college kids if they still want the socialism. <laughs> information. North Korea completely blocks and controls information to their people. So as a South Korean, do you think I can write a note, write a letter, postcard to North Korea? No, there's no postal service outside of North Korea. So what do we South Koreans do? We send leaflets in balloons. And when I say that, a lot of people think, well, do you write a note, like a little note, you know, like a balloon and send it? No, that's not what we do. These are the leaflets. These are the balloons. Do you see this as a people? Do you see how big these balloons are? We can hold a lot of things under these balloons. And the second picture is what's included in those balloons. And as you can see, there's a dollar bill. And you guys are all wondering, why the heck are you sending a dollar bill to North Korea? Guess what? Dollar bill is most craved currency in North Korea. They have three currencies. They have Korean one, which is their one. They also use a Chinese yuan. They don't like, like it as much as US dollar. US one dollar can get them about nine pounds of corn or two pounds of rice in their market. So if you can imagine getting that, it's a big lottery waiting for them. And that's why we put a dollar there. We also put underwears, some clothing, some medicine for that they can use, some of their stationaries, pens, and so forth, and most also importantly, radios. Because their radio is a fixed station, so they can control the stations to find South Korean channels. So we send them radios, hoping that they will hear what we are sending them in all FMs and all AMs hoping to reach them. As we talked about, there's no internet, only intranet. No books outside of North Korea. Can you imagine? They probably have a library. When you go to the library, there is nothing but just the books that are created by North Korean government. That's the only thing they can read. TV, same thing. Only propaganda programs created by North Korea. Education, they can only study what North Korean government tells you. And there's no religion. If you are caught trying to practice religion, they will kill you. Still, there are few people who believe in Christian in North. And some of them defected to South Korea. And we asked, how did you keep their religion going? If you ever get caught with the Bible, they will kill you. And do you know what they said? They memorized. The elders memorized as much as possible and gave it to the younger ones so they can all memorize each section. And that's how they kept the religion. If that's not the power of God, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and guess what? There are North Korean embassies around the world. And you will think, what about those diplomats? They've been to outside of North Korea they could go back to North Korea and tell them what is truly happening. Do you know why they don't? Because they're not allowed to leave North Korea until they leave one child behind. So until you have two children, you cannot leave the country because they will hold one child back as a hostage. <laughs> not, not far, yes, I agree. Let's talk about military. This is a one statistic. They are ahead of us. 
many times. North Korea is the 52nd largest country by population, but they consider to have war's fourth largest army. South Korea doesn't. North Korean military is spend about 25% of the GDP. Obviously, we have much higher GDP, but we don't spend 25% of our GDP into military. North Korean military service, it's required 10 years for men and three years for women. South Korea, female does not serve, only men serve, and they only serve 18 months. Yeah, they don't serve as much. As you can see, they overwhelm us in a lot of different statistics. But we have much better quality, much higher quality military than they do because of our technologies and advances. And obviously, because we have the United States who is in our ground helping us, protecting us. And we'll never forget how a lot of you guys, especially a lot of Minnesotans, came to Korea and fought for us and died for us. I'm very grateful for your service. We will never forget that. So, there is one other picture I'm going to show you. This picture went viral. This was picture was taken when Trump was visiting um, North Korea to have a meeting. And just, it was a random picture was taken. U.S. military person, North Korean military person, and South Korean military person, all standing together. And here it is. Now, this guy is a U.S. military. This is a South Korean military person. And the middle guy, who's about five, six, seven inches shorter, he is a North Korean military. My money is on these two guys who will be able to beat his ass. What do you think? <laughs> so hopefully, these statistics that I showed you clearly what happens when you choose to socialism. Only 70 years apart, guys. That was it. And this is how much two countries differentiated. And last, here's another reason I wanted to talk to you today. Because I find crazy similarities between North Korea and woke ideology in the United States. I know, I sound crazy, right? Really crazy. But let's see if how crazy I am. I'm going to read some of what North Korea does. And I want you to substitute North Korea with woke ideology and see if you find similarities as I do. Here we go. North Korea party decides what is right, what is wrong. And you are not allowed to ask questions or push back. If you push back or question them, they will punish you and everyone around you. Isn't that council culture here? North Korea party dictates what you think what word or vocabulary to say, what to believe. And they constantly come up with new concepts, new vocabularies, and enforce them. And if you don't keep up with these, they will be flagged as a traitors, and they'll punish you. Isn't that virtue signaling that is happening? North Korean party tells their people to denounce their public enemies in public form, to prove that you are loyal, and you agree with their ideology. Isn't that what social media is used for nowadays? North Korean party claims that they are the ones who are morally right, morally superior. The enemies are those who sold their souls to the riches for capitalism and the one in the power, the white men, they are evil. They just took that out of the North Korea, exactly. North Korean party claims that they are the party for the working class, the poor, the sick ones. They love everyone and everyone equally. They strive for perfect and complete equality. DI. North Korean party controls information distribution and any other information outside of their channels are called fake news. 
They actually used the fake news before America did. North Korean party classifies people based on their heritage, whether your ancestors were pro-Japan, pro-US, pro-Korea, or any of those. The North Korean party punishes people for their ancestors' sins, and they say those people need to pay back for their ancestors' sins. Reparation? North Korean party brainwashing people, brainwashing starts very early at elementary school. The regime appoints their most stretched believers into the teaching positions to make sure all kids are educated properly from their view or indoctrinated in regime's thinking. That is happening in the United States in education system. North Korean party teaches children how they should be loyal to the party and their ideology and not their parents. They are taught to watch their parents' behaviors when what they say inside of their home and they're trained to call out their parents when they're outside of party guidelines. And they get rewarded when they report their parents' the disloyal behaviors to North Korean party. College systems in the United States? North Korea party does not allow any religion and teaches that believing in religion is dangerous and evil. Clear side of the traitors, that's what they teach. That's what's happening here too, isn't it? These are so similar, aren't they? And that's what scares me the most, that we all need to stand up and fight and we need to stop this before it gets even bigger and further. Not only they are trying to make America into a socialistic country, but they are already using North Korea's methodology in America now. In conclusion, I'd like to remind you of the, some of the followers we talked about today. There should never be any discussion whether socialism is the way to go. Number two, North Koreans were just like all of us, wanting something good. But remember how all socialism starts. Instead of going to the utopia, they kill thousands and millions of people instead. Number three, the moment you start being okay with one discrimination, you open doors to all discriminations. And not speaking up and not getting involved is very much an action itself. We all need to speak up and fight together. And number five, how do we do that? We vote right in November. And the first thing we need to do is vote May to the Congress. Thank you for being. I will still take some few questions, if the time permits. If you guys have any question, I'll answer. Yes, sir. What, what do we know about the literacy of North Koreans? Can they actually read the Bibles that they want to have? They can read uh, their North Korean um, languages and so forth. I mean, our, we have state languages, but because of the 70 years apart, our language is kind of diverse quite a bit. Because of a lot of words we know we use are in English, such as a computer, laptops, and so forth. South Koreans adopted English as itself. North Korean does not. So North Korea came up with all different languages and vocabularies for those words, so we are kind of far apart. But because if they don't pass certain written exams and so forth, they get beat up. And they will be sent to the um, camps, uh, labor camps. So yes, they do have a literacy level. So therefore, if we can get the information to them, they will be able to open up their eyes. But not, only, not even 5% of the population, and we don't think they know what's going on outside of North Korea. Yes, sir. Yeah. In the Philippines, which has a U.S. educational system, and in Japan, um, children uh, in the very beginning uh, speak their native tongue. But then when I think it's six or eight years old, English is in the school system as well. And so they learn English starting from age six or eight. I'm wondering, uh, is that true in South Korea as well or no? No, not like the Philippines. The Philippines adopted English as their almost their national language. There's kind of a dual system of the language, but English is actually one of the most spoken language in the Philippines. South Korea isn't. Uh, still, South Korean is the most spoken language. 
but a lot of students. Um, we started learning about how to write and speak and so forth since our elementary school or junior high school. So a lot of people know how to speak English, but not that great. Because pronunciation is pretty hard. Yes, sir. I don't know the exact numbers, but I can tell you we do not have three months off. <laughs> that I can tell you. Our summer vacation was about three weeks. Uh, however, a lot of Korean students, not only they go to school, school, but we go all after schools. Education is number one priority for a lot of Koreans. And I know it's kind of sad to say, but a lot of kids are in some sort of school or learning system. And if you are sixth grade, you are not coming home until about nine o'clock because you're going to school and after schools. And if you are in high school, they, the, the one of the saying is, if, you, if they are sleeping six hours a day, they're not going to college. Four hours is the only thing they're allowed, four hours of sleep. And after that, every other waking hour, they are studying. America needs, don't need to go that far, but need to go a little bit further than where we are right now. Yeah, labor camps can be any ages, because if your parents are going to labor camp, your children are going together. And if you get become pregnant somehow in that labor camp by rape or any other reason, the children are born in labor camps. And you are not expected to make out a lot of labor camps. Um, they are given just barely enough food to live so they can work. And um, actually, anything. So they can say they could believe in religion. They spoke against North Korean party. And every North Korea house have to have North Korean dictators' pictures in their houses. Every house has three pictures. Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong and if they, they, are, they are required, when you enter the house, you bow at those pictures. And when you go to work, you have to bow to that pictures. If your house is on fire, you better get those pictures out of the house before your children. And every newspaper always have their pictures, and you treat their pictures like they are living, existing person. You cannot allow to fold them. You're not allowed to put things on top of it. And if you do, you might end up in labor camp. So any other reason they want to put it on. Yeah, they have guest depots in their system. Um, they are the basically North Korean armies or politician, uh, uh, police, um, you can think of it as. And their job is to catch these disloyal people and send them. Uh, they do a trial, which is basically judge tell you where you're going to. And you're a three generation. If you're caught speaking against the North Korean leaders, three generation is going to get murdered or sent to the prison, uh, labor camp. That's what they believe in. Sir? North Korea? Yeah. yeah, we have about 30,000 North Korean people who are defected from North Korea to South Korea, living in South Korea. And South Korea is our, um, our we treat them as just be their country, they're our men. Our constitution says any Korean person born in Korean Peninsula is South Korean citizen. So they're not actually defecting in a way, they're just given a new passport because they are South Koreans, which we have a program for them to be able to learn about South Korea systems and so forth. We also give them money and housing so they can start their lives in South Korea. But it is very hard. The reason is not what you think why it is. Of course, there is a different culture and all, all that stuff. But the reason they find it so difficult to live in South Korea is because they never learn to achieve anything. They don't understand why South Koreans work so hard or study so hard and try to achieve so hard. They don't get it. If you have enough food, why do you need it? The concept of achieving something in your life doesn't exist in their brain. So that has been the hardest thing for them to overcome, actually. Which is really sad. 
Do they have to join the military? No, uh, unless they want to, they don't have to. But if they're coming to South Korea as a young boy, let's say 10 years old or whatever, and they grew up, they can choose to go to the military or they can uh, decline to do so. I think that would give them some motivation. I know, a lot of people actually do choose to go because of that reason. But we also, also have to watch out because they can also send spies down to South Korea a lot, so one of the reasons we kind of watch out for that as well. If they're coming to North Korea, South Korea as a 17 years old, no way we will take them to the army. <laughs> but if they came here like a 10 years old, maybe they really grew up, grew up in South Korea, yeah, they're allowed to go to North Army service if they wanted to. Any other questions? Yes. I heard somewhere that if a North Korean family member defects and goes and sneaks down and um, gets to South Korea and makes it, that the rest of their family is subject to death and imprisonment and all that kind of stuff. Yep, three generations. That's why they don't, a lot of them don't do it because if they made it, then their mother and father or whatever would get killed. Mother, father, grandfather, grandchildren, relatives, uncles, and aunts all subject to death or labor camp. But they still do. Do you know why? It's not because of ideology. They have no idea what their ideology is. Because they're hungry. Every North Korean defects, they think they defected it because they were hungry. That's number one reason. Yes, ma'am. I heard something about somebody who had defected at one time, and they went to China. It was on a border, and the Chinese sent them. Yep, that's one thing we really would love United States and UN help. When North Korea people defect or escape north, they go to China. The reason is because they can't come to south because there is a DMZ, there's basically a minefield. You cannot cross that. So the only way they can go is north, which is China. And China's rule is if they are caught, they are sent back to China. You know what's going to happen to them when you send them, but they still do. And all we ask is just let them get through, let them get to the Korean embassy, or U.S. embassy, or U.K., or Spain, or any embassy, just to get to them, and we will take them. But no, China sends them back to North Korea. And the other thing that they do is they actually human traffic North Korean. When they defect, they sell women, like their property. Um, they are a lot of times sold as a sex um, reasons. And as you know, a lot of China does not have enough women. So this is what they do. They buy North Korean women. Sometimes one person can buy a woman. Sometimes a whole town buy a one woman because they don't have enough money. And you can imagine what. And also they buy and sell men for the labor reasons and organ harvesting. We expect about 300,000 people possibly, up to 3 million people, I'm sorry, 3 million people possibly in China that are North Koreans, but they can escape North China because of China, won't let them, and they are sent back to North Korea a lot of times. Yes, sir? Uh, I have a question in regards to like, because North Korea is so much <coughs> Do you ever see that more, uh, South Koreans or young South Koreans take for granted what they have? Because I think a lot of times in America, young people take for granted what Americans have. And oh, yeah. You see that in Korea. Same exact thing. It's happening here, it's happening to South Korea. And that's one of the reasons I speak up here, because I'm hoping this is a root cause. If we fix it here, maybe South Korea will be better too. But yes, a lot of young people take everything for granted and they don't understand what your life could have been if you were born in North. And that's one of the reasons a lot of TV programs like to have North Korean person to talk about their experiences and so forth, but still doesn't really get through their head a lot of times. We have the same issue. Yes, sir? Are you running out of uh, the old people who were around during the Vietnam or during the Korean War and they teach the young people, hey, it isn't always this easy, we did this. Yes, that is happening, which is very sad.
a couple things in aspect of that. So not only a lot of people who fought for South Korea freedom are passing away, which is kind of losing what the young people not understanding how hard it was fought to get this freedom. But what's also sad is because about 70 years apart, we have been North and South. So therefore, a lot of relatives or family members that they, they have in each other, uh, either North and South, they're all passing away as well. So we don't have any connection or of a person-to-person -person connection to North, which is the problem. So a lot of young people kind of basically say, North Korea, who cares? It's not my country. But I don't believe that they are my, our people. I think time is running out. I think I'm going to have the report back here. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.